I am Debbie Ferrarello. I am the Director of Parent Education and Lactation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm glad that you're here. My goal for our time together today is that you leave with all your nitty gritty questions answered, like where do we go, and what door do we go in, and how long do we stay, and all that kind of stuff. You will have lots of opportunity to ask questions, and there will be somebody who's going to ask a question that you didn't even know you had. So. That is a really good thing. So we are a baby-friendly hospital, and we are perinatal care certified. Have you heard of either of those things? Baby-friendly, yeah? Heard good things, I'm hoping. So let me tell you about baby-friendly. Baby-friendly is a, an international designation. It's through the World Health Organization and UNICEF. And throughout the world, there are over 20,000 baby-friendly hospitals. In our country, we were a little slow to get started, and when we became designated in 2015, we and our sister hospital, HUP, were the only ones in the area who were baby friendly. Now, it's really caught on, and there are hundreds of baby friendly hospitals with about 700 in the process of becoming baby friendly. And we're at the point now where one, one million babies are born every year in baby friendly hospitals. So what does that mean and why do we care? Baby friendly means that we want women to make informed decisions about how they're going to feed their babies. So we want you to have the information that you need to make a, an informed decision, and then we want to support you in that decision, whatever that decision is. So about 85% of our patients come in at planning to breastfeed. And so to help get off to a good start, all of our nurses who work in labor and delivery and mother-baby have had at least 20 hours of breastfeeding education. All of our doctors and midwives have had breastfeeding education. And we have board-certified lactation consultants seven days a week. Um, we also have a, a variety of practices that are designed to help mothers in that transition from birth to beyond and to help babies in their transition to life outside the womb, regardless of how they're being fed. And we'll talk about those as we go along. For those who are choosing to formula feed, Baby Friendly requires that a nurse give one-to-one -one information, education, to the patient in her room at the bedside. So that means teaching how to mix and prepare and store formula and talk a little bit even about amounts because you don't have to think about that with breastfeeding, right? But with formula you do. And so that's what Baby Friendly is about. It's, it's helping people make informed choices and then helping those parents get off to a good start and feel successful about their choice, whatever that may be. We are also perinatal care certified, and that is through the Joint Commission, which is the major certifying body for hospitals. And we are the only, as far as I know, we are the only um, hospital that's certified in our whole area in perinatal care. And so that means that we are constantly looking at our practices to make sure that they are as safe as can be and that they're evidence-based and that we are working on that every day. So that's what we do to, to be able to be the best birth hospital we can be for all of you, and we are really glad that you're here. Um, I talked about baby friendly. Okay, so getting here, nitty gritty things, parking. In the packet of handouts that you have, you have parking information about where the lots are and how much parking costs. If you come Monday through Friday between 6 or 5.30 in the morning and 6 o'clock at night, we have valet parking. So for just $2, more than the regular discounted patient rate, you can give them the keys and forget about it. So try really hard to go into labor Monday through Friday between 5.30 in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. Now, if you happen to come in on a weekend or the middle of the night seems to be a very popular option, no worries. Usually, walking is actually one of the very best things you can do in labor, and we'll hear more about that. And so usually you can park in the garage, which is right across the street, and walk on over, and that's actually a good thing. If though, and this is important for you partners to hear, if she says, I can't walk, you'll believe her. And you'll pull up, 
to the front as if we had valet parking, and you'll take the keys and you will take her to the labor and delivery area and you'll know where that is in just a minute. Okay, then you're gonna go back and move the car. You have about 15 or 20 minutes for this process to go back and move the car before the fine people at the parking authority move the car. Okay, so that's the deal with parking and coming in. You're gonna come in the main entrance. That's the entrance that you probably just came in, right? Did everybody enter on 8th Street? Okay, good, so you already know how to do that. So that's the entrance that you're going to use 24 hours a day. Now we do lock the doors at about eight or nine o'clock at night, and that's for safety. And we have a security guard who's posted right at the door. And the guard will look at you and jump to conclusions as to why you're here and open the door and let you in. Now, if there was a hospital-wide emergency and the guard was pulled from his post and it's the middle of the night and the door is locked, you would just come back at a more convenient time. No, you would um, press the button right here, which you didn't notice on your way in because you had no reason to, but you can notice on your way out. Look, I took a close-up of that. Ooh. Um, there's a call box right next to the front door. It lights up at night and it's an intercom. And if you press the button and say you're here to have a baby, guess what? They open the door. So we are um, very flexible about a lot of things that we'll talk about today, but there's two things we're just not flexible about. One is that we do want you to please come in to have the baby. The other is that we want you to go home with the same baby that you came in with. So to make sure that happens, after the birth, mom and her partner and the baby all get matching identification bracelets before anybody goes anywhere, right in the birthing suite. And then before leaving the birthing suite, even to go to mother baby, the baby gets another bracelet. This one's electronic, it's like a low jack. It alarms frequently. And I guarantee you'll hear it at least once during your stay. But when that alarm goes off, the doors lock and the elevators go on bypass. So it's, this is another layer of protection. And the third thing we do is we keep the babies in the room with the mothers. So it's not like we collect them at night and dole them out in the morning and hope we get it right. We keep the baby with you and that way you know it is your baby. Okay, question so far? Good, so you know how to come in. And then the very first thing you do when you come in is you go to the welcome desk. Did you notice that on your way in? Like if you come in and go straight ahead, there's a big desk, that's the welcome desk. That's where you go first and that's where your partner is going to get a badge. And your partner getting the badge there will keep him or her from having to leave your side later on. So you want him or her to stop at the welcome desk and get a badge. And then you'll take the elevators to the third floor and the elevators are so close that the people at the welcome desk can literally point and say, there's the elevator, go to the third floor. This is the last important thing that you need to remember from today because if you get off on the third floor and you look both pregnant and confused, someone will help you. When you get off on the third floor, there's a sign that says labor and delivery registration. That's for you. So you're going to get off and you're going to go to the right and you're going to go to the registration desk because you know that we can't do anything in healthcare without stopping at the lady with the computer, right? So that's your first stop. And from there, you go to the pet you, which is oddly named. It has nothing to do with pets. What it stands for is perinatal evaluation and testing unit. It's where everybody goes first, and it's triage. So I'm going to show you the picture, but I want you to keep in mind this is not where you have your baby. Okay? All right. So this room is a pet you room. It has two stretchers, it has a curtain in between, and it has a bathroom. Not glamorous, not that home-like environment where you want to have your baby, but that's where you go first for assessment. If you're coming in for a scheduled cesarean or a scheduled induction, usually they'll still have you stop at the pet you first. 
We are switching, changing to a single room pet you environment, but that's, that's gonna be several months away and probably after most of your due dates. So I just want you to, to be aware. So what happens when you come to the pet you? Well, you put on a hospital gown if you feel ready for that, and you pee in a cup for about the 10,000th time since you got pregnant and they will listen to your heart and your breathing and take a blood pressure and then listen to that beautiful sound of the baby's heartbeat and usually do an internal exam to see if you are in active labor. Active labor is what we consider when the cervix is about six centimeters dilated. So generally speaking, we don't want to admit you until you're in active labor, which is about six centimeters. So a lot of your labor takes place before you even get to the hospital. This is important for you to know for a couple of reasons, especially like partners. You feel like my job is to get her to the hospital. And so, you know, you're having a contraction. Okay, let's go. But really, you're going to labor quite a while in most cases before you ever come to the hospital and that's a good thing because most people feel more relaxed in their own environment and it can be a really long time like you can have a day or two of early labor before you come in so it's it's usually more comfortable and um, safer even in your own home um, so you want to think about your comfort measures and what you're going to do for comfort before you come to the hospital. So uh, also in the pet you is where conversations about your birth start. So we want every person who comes to Pennsylvania Hospital to have a baby to have a really good birth. But what a good birth is varies in people's mind from person to person. And we have about 5,200 women come here every year to have a birth. And their idea of what a good birth is might range from, I'd like the anesthesiologist to meet me in the parking lot for an epidural, all the way to I'm going to come on in, squat in the corner, catch my young kid, and go home, right? You're probably somewhere in between. But we don't know what you're thinking until you talk to us. So we encourage you to talk to your nurse in the pet you about your birth plan, about the things that are important to you so that we can support you and have a conversation. Sound good? In the pet you, you can have just one support person with you. And that's because picture this small room, two beds, two patients, two support people, doctors, nurses, midwives. It's too small to be safe and private. So for those two reasons, we limit the, the people who can be in there with you to just one support person. The whole rest of your labor, you can have up to three people with you if you choose to do that. And if you have a doula, and we'll talk more about doulas, you can have three people plus a doula. So it's just during this pet you time. One of three things can happen in the pet you as far as like what happens next. The first thing that could happen is they could do an assessment and say, yes, you're in active labor, in which case a nurse from labor and delivery walks over, picks you up, and walks you back to labor and delivery. Remember, walking is good. A second thing that can happen is they say, ooh, probably not today, and they send you home, and it's really hard you've already updated your Facebook status. Right? And you come in thinking, I'm having this baby, and you go home thinking I'm pregnant forever. But really, some of the best birth stories I've ever heard were from people who got sent home. And the reason is once they got sent home, they got involved in other things. And as their head was engaged elsewhere, their body took over and did what it was supposed to do. And they would feel the contractions, but they would tell themselves, rightfully so, you're fine, you're fine, you're OK. Until there's a point in every woman's labor that she knows she needs to be in that place where she's going to give birth. And she'll say to her partner, we need to go back. And he or she will say, really? Because we were just there like yesterday. No, this is different. We have to go back. And so they often would come in ready to have a baby. So I make no promises here, but that can happen. And it's often the silver lining. And the takeaway from that is also that you can actually influence how your birth goes. 
really like if you think of oh the contractions they're getting bad we tend to resist we fight against we tense up against things that are bad but if you instead think of contractions as getting stronger well now you're working with your body you can consciously visualize strong contractions melting your cervix bringing your baby down that's a completely different thing right so just think about that. The other thing is think about comfort measures because even if your plan is to have an epidural, there will be a good long while that you're laboring without the epidural. And you want to put off the medication as long as you can because many of the less desirable parts of epidural anesthesia are dose dependent. So that having an epidural for the last two or three hours is very different for you and your baby than having an epidural for 12 or 14 hours. So you want to use other comfort strategies as long as you can. Right? Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture of the family waiting area. And the family waiting area is right across from the pet you. What I particularly like about this picture is that it shows an empty family waiting area. And this is why I like an empty room. Um, how many people here have already had a baby at some point? You have. So you know, right, that birth can take a long time. It's not usually 60 minutes start to finish, including commercials. So if you call your fans and say, we're at the hospital, this room tends to start filling up. And we have had women who have actually felt pressure like people will, they'll send messengers in there and just be like, so dad wants to know how long it's going to be. He's got work tomorrow. <laughs> and really, when you are busy, like giving birth to a human being, you don't need to be worried about that. The other thing is this wonderful time that happens right after the birth. And in most cases, babies are awake and alert for about an hour and a half after the birth. And what we do after the baby is born is we dry the baby and put the baby right on mom's chest. And what do you think they do? For about 15 minutes, they kind of go, whoa. And after that, they crawl. Did you know brand new babies can crawl? If you didn't know that, when you get home tonight, Google breast crawl and you'll see videos of, of babies who are way down on mom's belly, like they're born and plunked right on mom's belly and they actually can crawl. They crawl right up to the breast and they look around and they see the darkened aerial and it's like a target. And they latch on and begin to nurse almost as if they're mammals. And if we disturb this process, they don't do what they're naturally supposed to do right after the birth. What we did for decades is we whisked the babies over to the French fry warmer, and we wiped them down, and we put ointment in their eyes, and we double wrapped them and handed mom a burrito and wondered why breastfeeding was so difficult. But now we know that if we put the baby immediately without interrupting, put the baby right on the mom, skin to skin, they usually just latch on and they begin to nurse all by themselves. Even if mom has made the choice not to breastfeed, we still encourage uninterrupted skin to skin after birth because the babies stay warmer than they would on the warmer. Mother is actually a better warmer. The babies breathe better and their blood sugars are more stable. And both mothers and babies are calmer and we know that by doing studies where we look at stress hormones in the saliva. And mothers and babies are both calmer when they're skin to skin after the birth. So it, it helps the baby adjust to life outside the womb. And if the mother is choosing to breastfeed, that's the best way to get started. So important, in fact, is this connection that even if a baby is born by cesarean, we put the baby skin to skin usually right in the OR if mom is up to it. And if not, then we wait until the recovery, which is just moments later. Okay. Now, if you have a room full of people who have spent the last 12 hours of their lives waiting for this blessed event, they'll know this baby is born. Somehow they know, and they all think that this time is for them. And their vision is to pass the baby around and have those conversations like, ooh, whose nose does she have? 
which is okay if that's what you want. But you don't get that immediate newborn time back. So I do encourage you to set the stage ahead of time so that you aren't at that moment disappointing people who love you or having an emotional tug of war or giving up this precious time. Questions about that? Okay. All right, we have 12 labor and, yes? So when, I mean, suggestion-wise, if you're, if you're not looking to give up that first hour and a half, when do you suggest like to making that call and telling people to come? Because I mean, if you still want people to show up and be there, but not interrupt that first hour or so, like, when do you suggest? It? So it depends. I think there's kind of layers of people who need to know. So the people who are the closest to you, who would gladly wait, you know, six days in that room just to be there. Um, you can tell those people and you can give them little progress reports as you go along um, and you can tell them but you know what when the baby's born we're gonna take an hour or so just us with the baby and that way they know to expect that the next layer of people can probably wait a little bit and we'll talk more about visiting hours and um, how you might want to navigate that as we go along yeah um, any other questions about that Okay, um, so we have 12 labor and delivery rooms. All the rooms have a bed like that. It's kind of like, not like you have at home. The bottom breaks away and they all have foot rests and they all have the option of putting a squatting bar on. A squatting bar is just, it looks almost like a trapeze, only more stable and you can use it so that when it's time to push, you can use it to hold on to so that you can get in a squatting position. Why would you want to do that? Well. When you're in a squatting position, it actually increases the diameter of your pelvis by a full centimeter. And again, you're giving birth to a person. So having an extra centimeter when you're giving birth to a 15 centimeter head is very helpful. It also is a, phys is a good position for the oomph that it takes to push this baby out. So that's just you know an option for you. Um, all the rooms have the fetal monitor in them. They all have the bed. They all have a, another couch or chair that can convert to a bed if, it, if it's a long day and your support person is um, needing to rest a little bit. They all have their own bath and shower. Um, so one thing that can happen is, is that stress hormones counteract labor hormones. Stress hormones counteract labor hormones. So sometimes just the stress of coming to the hospital, just the excitement of coming, is enough to stall your labor a little bit because very few people are chill on their way to the hospital to have a baby. You know, like, do you want to go? Sure. You know, <laughs> usually people are a little excited. So um, you can use the shower to help you relax. Most people can relax in a warm shower. So you're going to use all your comfort measures that you can, and you can add uh, taking a shower into that into the mix. We have the warmer in all the rooms in case we need it. But again, we usually don't use it. We usually use mom as the warmer. So in this room, you can have up to three people with you. And if you have a doula, you can have a doula with you as well. So sometimes people do have a room full of, of people waiting for them in the waiting room and the question comes up, can we switch out? And you, you can do that if you want to. So doulas, doulas are wonderful people. Doulas are people whose whole job is labor support. So they're not there in any medical capacity. They are usually not nurses. They go through training just to support people through labor. So they know tricks and techniques to help you feel comfortable, to help you get through contractions. It's great for partners too. It's a lot of pressure on a partner just to be your sole support person in labor. And sometimes the support person will say like, you're doing good. And the mother's thinking, well, how do you know, right? But if the doula says, you're doing great, you think, well, I must be doing great. So um, doulas, there's actually some evidence that they can shorten the length of your labor, that you're less likely to need birth interventions with a doula, that you have more satisfaction with the birth experience. 
and that the early breastfeeding can go better for you. So how do you get one of these people? Um, there are a number of ways that you can access doula services. You can hire a doula on your own, and some ways to find them are by going online to the Philly D phillydoulacoop.com or DONA, which is Doulas of North America, doulas or DONA.org. But you can also get a doula for free or very low cost with a sliding scale. So if you go to pals.prenatal at gmail.com and tell them when you're due, they can assign you to a doula who can match up with you prenatally and then follow you through your labor and they're volunteers. They are usually students who just love supporting women in birth. So, This is our birthing suite. This is for women who are looking for a low intervention childbirth and are low risk. So low risk, low intervention. Low intervention generally translates to childbirth without an epidural. Um, and if that's your goal, that's part of your conversation that you have when you're being admitted in the pet you, and this room uh, may be available for you. Um, this room has a jacuzzi, and you can, that's another way to help relax and cope. There's actually quite a bit of research on how water, both showers and jacuzzi, can provide comfort for you in labor. If this room is not available and you are low risk and looking for low intervention, it's really more about the care than the room. So by sharing your goals with your nurses, that's how you can get that kind of care even if this particular room is not available. Okay. Um, if you have a cesarean birth, this is, yes. Sorry to um, you said low risk. If you're high risk but still but it's okay with your doctor to go unmedicated, you cannot get that room, you just get a room. You, there are criteria, so next time you have an appointment, you can ask them if, they meet, if you meet the criteria for the birthing suite. But even if you don't, you could be in a regular birthing room and still have low intervention. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What, what, what kind of accessories do the other regular rooms have? Like, do you have the big balloon? So all the rooms, we have lots of birthing balls, which is really the same as a yoga ball, but if you call it birthing ball, now it sounds like official. Um, and we have peanut balls, which is, yeah, you saw that, the yellow one, the peanut ball with pe people love. We have rocking chairs. We have um, birthing, cha like chairs that, for squatting. We have um, mirrors. Some people like to look at a mirror while they're pushing and they can see progress. Other people are very inwardly focused and there could be mirrors and they wouldn't even know. So, um, so we have all kinds of things to help you through. Okay. Um, so if you are having a cesarean birth, we have the operating rooms right in labor and delivery. So you don't go where we do the hips and knees and gallbladders. And you recover right in the labor and delivery area as well. So there would be a nurse there with you and your baby as you recovered from anesthesia before going to your room. OK, so you stay for about usually an hour and a half or two hours after the birth. and. We, the, one of the last things we do before you leave that room is weigh the baby. The weight can wait. We wait for that because we want that uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin time. And at the end, we weigh the baby, then wrap the baby, and then you go to the mother-baby area. So you first give birth on what floor? Such a good group. And then after you go to mother baby, which would be fourth floor, fifth floor, or sixth floor, four, five, or six, we have three floors for mother baby. And that's where you stay for the rest of the time. So this is one of the rooms. And how long you stay, if you have a vaginal birth, you usually stay one and a half to two days. And if you have a cesarean birth, usually three or four, depending how you and the baby are doing. 
it goes so fast. So I encourage you to, to make the most of this brief time that you're here. There are people here to help you. That's what we're here for. Um, so ask questions, ask for help. Um, the, the baby, we keep the baby in the room with you, so the baby's first bath is right there in the room. It's a great time for you to get to know your baby's little body um, and to ask questions about it. And we keep the baby with you 24 hours a day. Um, for those of you who are more than, say, six months pregnant, when is your baby most awake? What time of day? At night, yes. So, and that's because all day long you run around and you rock this baby to sleep. And then at nighttime you go to bed and the rocking stops and the baby wakes up, right? So this is the same person that you're going to give birth to. It's like giving birth to a person who has jet lag. And it takes a while to get over jet lag. Your baby's going to want to be a day person. Your baby's going to want to be awake when people are happy to see him <laughs> and want to play. But that takes a little while. So in the beginning, your baby will be more awake at night, which makes it all the more important to keep the baby with you at night because that's when the baby's going to feed the most, which is going to trigger a good milk supply. That's when you learn to take care of the baby and start interpreting those sounds and movements. And there are people to help you. Like it could be 3 o'clock in the morning and you press a button and a nurse comes. Whereas if you wait until you're home and it's three in the morning and you press a button, the TV turns on. It's just not the same level of support. So we encourage you to keep the baby with you as much as you can. Some well-meaning people will say things like, you know what, send the baby to the nursery, you need to sleep. And the interesting thing is that I know of three studies that looked at the amount of sleep that women get in the hospital after having a baby. In none of the studies did women get any more sleep by sending the baby to a nursery. One of the studies, the women got an average of 15 minutes more sleep when they had the baby in the room with them than they did if they sent the baby out. But the bad news is that across all three studies, the total amount of sleep was four hours, not in a row. So you're going to be tired. You're going to be tired. We have quiet time between 4 and 6 in the afternoon. And quiet time is a time that most babies will sleep. And they'll sleep because for most of us, 4 to 6 in the afternoon is a busy time. Right? So the baby's used to sleeping at that time. So between 4 and 6, we close the doors, we dim the lights, and we don't go in your room unless you call us. And we encourage you to put the baby in the bassinet next to your bed, turn off all your devices, close your eyes, and at least pretend to sleep. And there's two reasons for that. One is to reduce the risk of the middle of the night meltdown, and the other is for safety. So the meltdown happens just because you're exhausted. I mean, most of you are not sleeping through the night right now, right? You have a baby jumping on your bladder, and every 20 minutes you have to get up and go to the bathroom. And then you can have early labor, which can last for a couple of days, which is very distracting. And then you have the big work of labor, and then the, oh my gosh, we have our baby. And then just as you're ready to sleep, your baby's awake. So um, we do encourage you to protect that time. We won't do it for you. So if visitors come between 4 and 6, we won't say, sorry, you can't come in, because that's up to you. But we encourage you to tell your fans not to come between 4 and 6. The other thing is the safety. So if you are really, really tired, and it's the middle of the night, and you're up feeding your baby, what do you think happens? Right? You can fall sound asleep, and this precious baby that's in your arms fall down and there's no safe way to sleep with a baby in our skinny little high off the ground beds there's just not sometimes women put like pillows on either side well that's a suffocation risk so we really encourage you to get that rest during the day to help you be safer at night yeah There's one bed per room. However, all the rooms are private and they all have a couch 
or chair that converts to a bed. So we encourage you to keep, to have a support person stay overnight with you. And especially if you have a cesarean, you almost need to have somebody stay overnight with you to help you with the baby, the tiny little person who has so much power. So we encourage you to, to use that extra bed to have somebody stay with you who's willing to help at night and be awake. Okay. Now, if you are just too tired, like I said, I can't do it, I'm not safe, I'm too tired, we'll take the baby. We want you to be safe. But we encourage you to stay with the baby as much as you can, just because that's a great way to start to get to know your baby, to feel more confident and competent for going home with your baby, and to start building your milk supply. Questions about that? Okay. I have just one question. Yeah. Um, do you have lactation specialists? Can we ask Yes, so the nurses all have extensive um, education, training to help with breastfeeding. And then if there's a special problem, then they can put a patient in for a consult with a lactation consultant. So then the lactation consultant would, would prioritize that person to come and help. But the first couple of times, like the nurses will be there to guide them? The first time, yes. Yes. Yeah, the first time in labor and delivery, there's a nurse right there with you. And then when you get to the room, there's a settle-in period. And then um, the, you might be, the more time you spend just skin to skin with your baby, even after labor and delivery, the more the baby just knows what to do. And there, but there's help. The nurses and lactation consultants are there to help you. Um, all of the rooms have their own bathroom with a shower. And there's a photographer who will come around and ask if you want pictures taken. That's entirely up to you. Um, so food, you'll get hungry. You'll be um, hungry after doing the work of labor. And we keep sandwiches in labor and delivery. So right after the birth, you can have a sandwich. And as you're holding your baby, you can get crumbs on him and he won't care. Um, and then uh, in your room, we have morning coffee, breakfast, lunch, dinner and evening snack cart. And if you're still hungry, it's okay. We have binders with takeout menus. For partners, we have uh, the binders with takeout menus. We also have the cafeteria, which is actually a really good cafeteria. And we have um, the coffee cart, which is right next door here, which is really good coffee. My recommendation is get the coffee here and then the food in the cafeteria. So um, they have also locally baked pastries and things like that. And then we talked about quiet time. And then um, we are promoting safe sleep with babies and right from the start, right from the first day in the hospital. And so we encourage you not to put anything in the bassinet but your baby. So no cute toys, no extra blankets, just the baby. And the baby, you should put the baby down on his back, completely on his back, not his side, and preferably preferably at arm's reach, so right next to you. And then, after your discharge, what happens next? We encourage you to go visit Solutions for Women. And Solutions for Women is across the street. So we are at 8th and Spruce. Solutions for Women is at 7th and Spruce, so one block over in the Duncan Garfield building. Um, Solutions for Women houses a health boutique as well as our support group for new parents. And we also have outpatient lactation. And we, many of our classes are there. So this is our health boutique. And the people who work there, this is a real thing. They are certified nursing bra fitters. So probably not like when they were little, you know, someday when I grow up, I want to be a certified nursing bra fitter. But they really did go through training for that. And it is the best place in the whole area to go for nursing bras. Um, people come from far away because they know how to fit them. And the prices are actually at or below what you find at other places. Like I will go to Target and when I'm there, I look at what they have and what we have. And when they have the same products, ours are less. So even though it's very boutique-y and you get tender, loving care, it is not expensive. Um, we also have outpatient lactation, and we're very excited about that. So board-certified lactation consultants are there, and you can make an appointment 
both prenatally and after the baby comes. So if you had a prior experience with breastfeeding that didn't go well, and so you're nervous, or if you have a situation that you think might, might need necessitate having a special plan, like maybe if you have diabetes or if you have had breast surgery, you can make an appointment to see a lactation consultant before you give birth. And then after you have the baby, almost everybody needs some reassurance and, and um, guidance after the baby's born. And they will spend an hour with you taking a history, observing a feeding, making a plan, sending the report to your physician and the baby's physician. Um, we do all that. We bill insurance and there is no copay. We even have some grant funding, so if you have no insurance, you can still go. So we encourage you to make the appointment, and we, this is just part of us wanting you to meet your goals, whatever those goals may be. And you have information in your packet about solutions. Okay, so what questions do you have? Yes? Uh, what kind of baby supplies are provided at the hospital? Okay, so in the hospital, we basically give you everything you need to take care of your baby while you're in the hospital. So we'll provide diapers, we'll provide um, onesies or t-shirts to wear, and blankets for the baby, and also supplies for you, like um, pads and these mesh underwear that people love the mesh underwear. I get calls, how do I get that mesh underwear? Um, and then definitely bring your own toiletries because like your toothbrush is nicer than our toothbrush. Um, and then something to go home in and clothes for the baby to wear home. The clothes for you to wear home, I'm sorry, are still maternity. And then there is in your handout, there's a list of suggested items to bring, to pack. And I think there was, yes? Yeah. Well, um, how long is recommended to, to you know, the baby sleep with you, with the parents? They have to own a uh, bed, of course, but uh, to what month or to how long to even do it? Okay. That's an excellent question. So the question was, how long should the baby sleep in the same room? And the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends at least six months and preferably one year of the baby sleeping in his own sleep surface, at, preferably at arm's reach, but at least in the same room. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Does someone um, teach you how to sleep train the baby? How to sleep train? train the baby? Um, no, because newborn babies are, it, they're too young for that. We are, at Solutions for Women, we are introducing a new class um, geared for parents of babies four weeks to four months, so that will be coming. Um, but before then, they really aren't ready for anything like that. Yes? Um, baby formulas, is there different types of baby formula for different uh, weeks of, uh, to the baby? Um, no, if formula is, is desired, we do have it here. We usually, um, we usually have either Similac or Enfamil, and it doesn't change as time goes on. It's just whether the baby is one day old or 10 months old, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Yes? What's your policy on um, mothers eating while they're in active labor? <laughs> Yeah, um, so most of your providers will encourage you to eat lightly before you come in. So eating lightly is like not, this is our last cheese steak before we give birth, because you're likely to, to see it later. Um, but during active labor, it's just clear liquids. Yeah. What else? Oh, and I've told you that I would talk to you about visitors, right? Visiting hours, and I forgot. Um, so visiting hours are 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., but don't do that to yourselves, okay? I did focus group research. It was actually published. It was published a couple years ago now. And I interviewed or I did focus groups with women who had recently given birth here, and they were all first-time parents, and they all said when they were pregnant, they just envisioned this room full of visitors and everybody happy and pass passing the baby around. And when the time came, they wished no one was there. One woman went so far as to say, when I think of all the people I did that to, she was quite distressed. And all she did was visit her friends who had had babies. So think about it. Um, I would say that at least half the people that you say, you know what, wait till we're home. They might go, really? But inside, they're like, yes. 
because they don't have to deal with our parking and standing in line for a pass and then those awkward conversations like you walk in the room ooh not a good time and um, if they wait until you're home they have to bring you meals right so it's so much better for everybody if you wait until you're home. Now there are people, you know, if your mom is around, you can't say sorry, you can't see this grandchild. But, but like the office, you know, your neighbors, they can probably wait until you're home. And then 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. But remember to carve out quiet hours from four to six. Okay. Yes. Um, we have a level three neonatal intensive care unit. So it's the kind of thing that you hope is never needed. But when it is, it's really good to know that we have this high level of care. We're the kind of hospital that other hospitals send their babies to. And it's staffed by neonatologists from Children's Hospital. Yeah. Other questions? So you know where to park, what door to come in, you go to the welcome desk, you go to the third floor, you go to mother baby and stay there one and a half to two days after vaginal birth, three or four after a cesarean birth. So I will be here for a few minutes so that if there's a question that you didn't ask, you can come up and ask me, yeah. Um, what is regulation for what waiting for the placenta to come out? Is there something you use to help that, or do you...? Um, so at, the question was about what do we do about waiting for the placenta to come out, and usually um, the fact that the baby nurses, that nurses ca nursing causes contractions, and oftentimes that will release the placenta. We also usually give Pitocin, which is a synthetic form of the natural hormone oxytocin, which makes the uterus contract after the birth that helps to decrease bleeding and to promote healing and the release of the placenta. Okay, Do, is there an option to opt out of that if it's not needed? You can, that would be part of your discussion. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming. Have a happy birthday. <laughs>